Good morning. Good morning. I know, uh, at least I'm speaking for myself here, we're struggling this morning. Uh, we've been robbed, and uh, hopefully we can get through it well. Uh, it definitely threw me for a loop this morning. Alarm goes off at 6.30, I come look outside, it's darker than typical, I go, there's no way, snooze, 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 and uh, I panic to get ready after I realize I snooze too much, get in the car, different times in my car, on my phone, I'm losing it, thinking I'm in the twilight zone or something, and so I look up a world clock, and that way I'm like, at least I can get legit news there, and uh, yeah. We lost an hour. I had no idea that we were going to do that. Um, so bear with me this morning, and uh, we can get through this pretty well, I believe. Turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, we're going to be looking at verses 11 through 15 briefly, and uh, springing off from there. In Matthew chapter 7, as you're turning there, in verse 1, the Lord said, Judge not that you be not judged. And some have taken this verse and ran with it. They have used it to espouse all sorts of ideas that you cannot cast a single judgment upon any one person or any group of people, that you should be overlooking their flaws and their faults. And, um, you know, is that really what Jesus talking about there. Judge not that you be not judged. Whenever we consider what else Jesus has to say about judgment, you see in John chapter 7 and verse 24 that Jesus said, do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. The King James says righteous judgment. And then even in the context of Matthew chapter 7, he proceeds in verses 15 through 20 to tell those whom he's preaching to, whom he just told, judge not that you be not judged, to make judgments, but to make judgments based upon the fruit that is born from the tree instead of the appearance of the tree. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus talked about judgment. Now, judgment is not something that people like. People typically run away from the topic of judgment. We don't like to be judged. We don't even like the idea of being judged. Perhaps you've heard the expression, maybe it's been hurled at you, only God can judge me. Usually people use this in a rather immature way as a defense mechanism to deflect your comments and your suggestions and maybe your good Christian advice on how they ought to be living. However, as immature as maybe a statement like that is, it is absolutely true. God will judge us. In Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27, the Hebrew writer says, And it is appointed uh, once for man to die, and after this, the judgment. That's the two things in life you can hang your hat on. You're going to die. And you're going to be judged. You're going to be judged by the Lord. Look here at Revelation 20. Revelation 20 and verses 11 through 15, John is going to describe uh, the judgment scene. It, it, this is a very brief description here. There's a lot of different details here. We begin here in verse 11. He says, Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. So verse 11, John is seeing God sitting upon his throne. Uh, he says, From his presence earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. Uh, the earth and sky are fleeing out of fear for him. There's no place. They have no uh, they have no audience with the Lord. But who has audience with the Lord? We continue in verse 12. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the Lord. That's who has audience with the Lord. Those who are dead. All the dead is what John's trying to emphasize here. Both great and small. Everyone as significant as we could say Augustus Caesar. Everyone as, as significant as as Abraham Lincoln and everyone as little as insignificant as Cody Kilgore. Everyone is standing in the judgment. He said, I saw the great and small standing before the throne. And here it is. And books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. 
and the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. So verse 12, we see the books being opened. We see the book of life being opened. This is what John focuses it on. This is the verses 11 and 12, we'll call it 12a, are the introduction to what John is saying. Verses 12b through 15, that is the highlight. And the highlight, the climax of it all, is right when the book of life is open. That's what John zeroes in on. That's what he focuses. Uh, that's what he focuses on. What is the book of life? A lot of people have different ideas on what the book of life is. Some suggest that it's the same book that you see in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 16, which there is called the book of remembrance. And the uh, book of remembrance was, uh, was a book that bore the names of those who feared the Lord and remembered his name. And so it's just as those people feared the Lord and remembered him, God honored them and remembered them by writing their name in a book, a book that bears quite the significance, uh, especially when it comes to eternal life. And when we look in the book of Revelation at this book of life, we're going to see that it's mentioned seven different times. It'll be mentioned as the book of life. It'll be mentioned as the book of life of the Lamb. And sometimes it'll be called the Lamb's book of life. But regardless of that, seven times the name appears. It comes onto the scenes. And twice in our passage that we're looking at here, verses 11 through 15, it's going to come up. A good rule of thumb for looking at a, a context, a scripture, a, a passage, a pericope, whatever you might want to call it, is if you see a word being mentioned twice, three times, four times, underline it, highlight it, because it's very significant. Very significant. The book of life to be mentioned here twice. What does that tell us? It is very, very significant. Um, now let's look back at verse 12. And, and the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. Verse 15, this is significant. This is what we need to be keeping in our minds throughout this whole lesson. Because we're going to pop right back to this. Verse 15, and if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Let's read it again. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the fire. We see verse 15, if your name's not in the book of life, you're thrown into the fire. And so by implication, what would that mean of those whose name is found in the book of life? Would they also be thrown in the fire? No, by implication, they're withheld from the lake of fire. The question we need to be asking our, our, ourselves this morning from verse 15, do we have our names in the book of life and if we don't how can we have our name in the book of life we understand that a judgment is coming Hebrews 9 and verse 27 but how is it that God will judge us how will God judge us look with me at Acts chapter 17 and let's look at verses 30 and 31 Acts 17, verses 30 and 31. We use this passage often in the context of repentance. Uh, you know verse 30 perhaps pretty well. The times of ignorance God overlooked. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. But our focus here is verse 31. Because he has fixed a day. What does that mean? There's an appointment. There is an appointment. He has fixed a day on which... He, God, will judge the world in righteousness by a man, 
whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. God has fixed a day in which you and I will be judged. He has appointed a man who will do that judging. He has proven, he has given us assurance that the judgment is true and that it is a reality, something we can hang our hat on, it's a guarantee in life, by raising this said judge from the dead. But the thing we want to focus on in verse 31 is how will God judge us? Look at verse 31 and we will see that God will judge us by his righteousness. He will judge us by his righteousness. It says he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. Let's consider this. Consider the fact that God is always fair. God is always fair. Sometimes we wonder and we ask questions about uh, who will be in heaven. Sometimes we ask questions about a child, the aborted baby. We ask questions about teenagers because we're, especially teenagers, we kind of taught her that line or or are they not accountable? What's the issue here? Uh, we, we ask a question about the special needs. We ask a question about people with dementia. Uh, and sometimes we scratch our heads as we begin to give an answer. And sometimes our answer is a little vague. Uh, sometimes we walk into that discussion of will such people be saved? Will they be in heaven with a little bit of uh, ambiguity? Uh, what we need to understand, the bottom line whenever it comes to judgment in that sense, is that we can count on God to do the fair thing. We can count on God to do the right thing. Psalm 7 and verse 11, God is a righteous judge. That is a guarantee. We can bank on that. God's judgment will be right. It will be just. It will be fair. Whatever it is that I, I hear on the day of judgment, it's going to be the right call. It's going to be exactly what I need to hear. If it's depart from me, you worker of lawlessness, then I deserve it. If it's enter into the joy of your master, then God says, I deserve that. That's what I'm worthy of. God is not going to make a mistake. We understand that it's possible in our courts to make a mistake, punishing the innocent and acquitting the guilty, but that is not at all possible in the heavenly courts. God will by no means be wrong when he should have been right. Uh, he, he will by no means be crooked where he should have been just. He will by no means be partial where he should have been fair. We can trust that God will by no means, name him, chapter 1 and verse 3, acquit the guilty. And he will not accuse the blameless. Psalm 1 and verse 6, for what reason? Because he knows their way. He knows their way. When called before the Lord in judgment, what I need to know, what I can rest assured in knowing, is that I will be judged by his character. I'll be judged by his fairness. And second to that, in the judgment, I can be assured that God will judge us by our opportunity. By our opportunity. Now, I know that might sound a little funky at first. Are you saying, Cody, that there's a pass for those on the remote island that, that have never heard the gospel? Are they going to receive salvation? Absolutely not. By no means. I say that because in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verses 6 through 9, Paul writes, and it's very clear, that when the Lord returns in flaming vengeance with his angels, he's going to... Uh, he's going to Pour out his wrath upon those who do not know God and those who have not obeyed the gospel. Is that an unfortunate thing for the person on the remote island? Ah, sure. Should their forefathers have thought about that before they moved out somewhere remote? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we, we understand that a man does not bear the consequences of another man's sin, right? But there is still uh, damage that can be inflicted by the father's decisions uh, in the son's life. The truth of the matter is that whenever it comes to God's judgment, there is a certain degree 
uh, to which judgment is going to be based upon the opportunities that we've had in life and the light that we have received. Look with me at Luke chapter 12, and verses 47 and 48. Luke chapter 12, verses 47 and 48. This is in the context Jesus tells his disciples to be ready, to stay dressed for action, to be ready at all times, because you never know when the Lord is going to come. In verses 47 and 48, he uses the term servant to describe these individuals. He says in verse 47, And that servant who knew his master's will, but did not get ready or act according to his will. What does that mean? The servant, let's look at it this way, the Christian who knew his father, his master's will, who knows the will of God, knows what he's supposed to be doing as he prepares for the judgment. We have an appointment, Hebrews 9 and verse 27. When we have an appointment, we get ready. We don't sit on the couch and wait until the last minute and say, oh, let me hurry up and go. We're ready. If you were to go and sit in court today, would you be ready? Would you be there early? Of course you would. That's a responsible thing to do. So the, ma or the servant, the Christian, has the, uh, the master's will, verse 47, and he refuses to get ready. What does it say? He will receive a severe beating. A severe beating. Verse 48, but the one who did not know and did what deserved a beating will receive a light beating. Everyone to whom much was given, of much of him will be required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. What's the point? The point is, the more light you receive, the more truth that's been revealed to you, the greater uh, opportunities availed to you, the greater responsibility you have. The greater responsibility to do right that you have. And evidently, the more that you mishandle that, but the greater responsibility, if you mishandle that great responsibility, there comes a great punishment. A great punishment. We ask the, Christ, uh, the question, what about the apostate Christian? Uh, when we look in 2 Peter chapter 2, in verse 21, we get an idea of what the judgment will be like for the apostate Christian. Uh, Peter uh, didn't skip around any corners here. It says in 2 Peter chapter 2, in verse 21, for it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness, and after knowing it, to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. It would have been better. What is Peter saying here? The judgment is going to be worse for them. It is going to be bad for those who have never heard the truth, that person on that island. It is going to be bad for those who have heard it and never responded. That, that rocky soil that you throw the seed upon and immediately cast it away. But it is certainly not going to be anywhere as near as bad for those individuals as it is going to be for those who have heard the truth, who have obeyed the truth, and have departed from the truth. God is fair. Do I know for certain what it means? That it will be harsher. That it will be a more severe beating. Uh, it will be worse for them to have never... Or it would be better for them to have never known the truth than to know and depart from it. Do I know what all that entails? No, I really don't. I, I have some ideas, but nothing concrete. However, I do know this to be for certain. In James chapter 3 and verse 1, James says, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. What I know is that nobody's getting out of the judgment and that God is going to be fair. And that evidently there are some degrees into which he will judge men. When we think about this idea, you will be judged based off of your opportunities. We need to be thinking about our opportunities. What if we are lost? What if we've heard the gospel time and time again, and yet we're still lost? We could receive a few stripes or many. However, I know uh, personally... I don't want to receive any stripes. I don't even care what it means. I know it's negative. I don't want to receive it. Hopefully you wouldn't want to either. 
And we need to understand and say, God is going to judge us. He is appointed at once for man to die, and then comes the judgment. But we can rest in knowing that God is going to judge us according to his character, and he's going to be fair, uh, and he is going to judge us according to our opportunities that we've had. And more than that, God is going to judge us by the word that we have received. God is going to judge us by our Lord Jesus Christ. That is how he will judge us. In other words, the Bible speaks, to, uh, when the Bible speaks of the judgment day, it's speaking uh, of this great scene. Uh, but narrowing it down, when we look at the judgment day, when we look at the one who does the judging, it is going to be Jesus Christ himself. Look over here at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Look there at verse 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. This is how this is how the Christian is supposed to see things. Understand this. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 1. For we know that the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed. We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. This is an eternal perspective that he's talking about here. This is verse 7, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Again, eternal perspective. Verse 10, how does the eternal perspective look, to, look at the judgment? For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. The eternal perspective keeps in mind the fact that there is a time in which I must prove myself worthy. There is a time in which I'm going to stand before the Lord himself and, whether, uh, and hear one of two responses. Depart from me or enter in. Verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due. What's another word for due? Fair. So we may receive what is fair for what has been done in the body, whether good or evil. We're going to be judged. We're going to be judged by Christ. And be judged for what we have done. What did we notice back in Acts 17 verse 31? We notice that he will judge the world in righteousness by a man that he has appointed. Now look at John chapter 5 and verse 22. John 5 in verse 22. John 5, notorious passage. Talks about his authority talks about those who bore witness to his authority. And now in the context of his authority, we see in verse 22, what does Jesus say? He says, the Father judges no one. Okay. Well, who does the judging? Jesus. But has given all judgment to the Son. All judgment has been given to the Son. Jesus Christ is the judge. Judgment is by Jesus, and it's going to be according to his word. John 12 and verse 48, the one who rejects me and does not receive my word has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. What is the keys of judgment? The books were open in Revelation chapter 20. So one book might uh, be interpreted as the words of Christ. Remember, he mentioned books. <laughs> Then he zeroed in on the book of wine. Uh, we can't deduce that for certain, but we can know for certain that the words of Christ are going to judge us. And the words of Christ are strict. And the words of Christ are narrow. There are two ways. Two ways. A broad way. It's easy. leads to death. And then there's a hard way. It's narrow. It leads to life. Certainly God is going to judge us by the words of Christ. And more than that, God is going to judge us by our words. God will judge us by our words. Look here at Matthew chapter 12 in verses 36 and 37. Matthew chapter 12, verses 36 and 37. Here Jesus is talking about a tree. This idea of the tree is known by its fruit. John talked about in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 10. You're going to know those who do works of righteousness by their works. You're going to know those who are 
uh, who do works of evil by their words. John, uh, Jesus already spoke about this in Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 to 20. You will recognize people by their fruits. That's how you're supposed to look. Now, Jesus kind of takes it and narrows in a little further with that idea. And he says here in verses 36 and verse 37, things which should really, I don't know if scare is the right word, maybe uh, cause us to treat life a little bit more serious. Verse 36 and 37, make us more aware. Verse 36, I tell you on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Every single word is going to come into play with the judgment. What have my words been like? What has been my manner of conversation? Have I been perverse in my speech? Have I been uh, cursing whenever I might think it's appropriate? Have I said jokes that are distasteful? Or my, is my uh, speech riddled with uh, slurs? Uh, do I speak nothing but angry words? Am I hateful in my speech? Am I hateful towards others when I speak to others? Am I someone who dwells on the negativity so every time I speak it's something negative? Am I someone who is always complaining? Always complaining. Remember, complaining is what got the children of Israel swallowed up in, in the earth. When we look at our speech, we've got to understand that there are commandments. Those are his words that dictate that we must speak better with our words. We must speak better than the world. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, let no corrupting talk uh, come out of your mouth, but only such as uh, is good for building up, as it fits occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 4, let there be no filthiness, or, or, nor a foolish talk, nor crude joking, which is out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. Colossians 4 and verse 6, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know uh, how you ought to answer each person. Titus 2, verses 7 and 8. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works, and your teaching show integrity, dignity, and sound speech. Why? That you cannot be condemned, so that an opponent, uh, opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. Colossians 3, verse 17. Whatever you do, in word or deed, everything in the name of our Lord Jesus, giving uh, thanks to God the Father through him. The judgment is going to boil down to a lot of things. It's going to be his character. It's going to be our opportunities. It's going to be his son. It's going to be our words. And even further, looking at ourselves, it's going to be our works. God will judge us by our works. Uh, what did we see twice in Revelation 20, verses 11 and 15? We saw twice mentioned there that everyone was judged according to his works, deeds, those actions. Romans 14 and verse 12, each one of us will give an account of himself to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 3, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Now, what does that include? Keep this in mind. Proverbs 15, verse 3. Behold, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. So what does that include? That includes the things that are done in private. That includes the things, uh, that includes the, the way that I behave at home. That includes the way I behave in my car. That includes the way that I behave in traffic. That includes the way that I behave whenever it's just me inside of four walls. Things done in private will be seen. They will be brought up in the judgment. This also includes the things that are done in public. The way I treat the stranger. Yeah, you know what? I, I may be able to get away man to man yelling at some guy that I've never seen before. I may be able to get away man to man cursing him out. But who's watching? Proverbs 15, 3, the Lord. Am I going to get away with it in the grand scheme of things? Absolutely not. But sometimes we treat strangers as that kind of get out of jail free card, no consequence. Um, 
the way I treat a brother is going to be brought up? Have I loved my brother? Have I shown love to them? Have I done works of love for them? How have I treated my family? All these different things. Everything I do in private and in public will be brought up. Now, for some, that is a scary thought. Here's your opportunity to take a lesson from a cow. Walk whenever you feel the prodding iron. Make the right change. Do what is right. God, here's our last point. You ready? God will judge us by our thoughts. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 5. First Corinthians chapter four and verse five. Paul says here, therefore do not be or therefore do not pronounce judgment before the time before the Lord comes, who will bring to light, here it is, will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. What's the idea here? That when the Lord returns and judges us, even our hearts and our minds will come into play. Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 14. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Now what does that include? That includes every lustful thought, every vengeful thought, every hateful every angry thought, every envious thought, every spiteful thought, every ungrateful thought. That includes everything that's going on in your noggin. On the judgment day, nothing is going to be hidden. Hebrews 4 verse 13, And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him whom, uh, to whom we must give an account. Was Hebrews 4 verse 13 telling us that he knows Every opportunity we've had. He knows every word we've spoken. He knows every work we've done. And he knows every thought we've had. On the judgment day, there are going to be no excuses. It won't be like the American court where uh, if you have the right lawyer, they can swindle a criminal out of conviction. We won't be able to stand before God as guilty of sin have a defense made that if it doesn't fit, you must quit. You know, God's not going to shirk his shoulders and go, you know what, you got me there, Mr. Kardashian. I'm going to let him go. No. God is not going to make a mistake. The evidence is going to be laid forth and the appropriate, the fair judgment will be made regarding where we should spend eternity. Are we going to be cast into the lake of fire along with death and Hades. The second death, the lake of fire, is eternal separation from God. Is that what we'll receive? Look back with me right quick. Revelation 20 and verse 15. This is the most important verse for this lesson. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life. He was thrown into the lake of fire. What did we say about that verse? What did we say uh, that it teaches by implication of those whose name is found in the book of life? It means that they're going to be spared that judgment. They're not going to be cast away. What if your name is in the book of life? What does that mean about you? come the judgment. What does it mean to have your name in the book of life? This is what it means. It means that you've heard the gospel, first and foremost. You learn of what Jesus Christ has accomplished for you. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 and 4. He was born. He uh, lived. He died. He was buried. He resurrected. He ascended. Why? For what purpose? For our salvation. You learn of what Jesus has accomplished for you, and you know that it's something that you could never Accomplish for yourself. It means, second, that you've obeyed the gospel. You've put on Christ in baptism, washing away your sins, Acts 22 and verse 16, and were raised in him as a new creation, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. It means, third, that you've been faithful to the gospel, that you've been onward obedient, 
and you practice ongoing obedience, Romans 6, verses 3 and 4. It means, fourth, that God has added you to the church, Acts 2 and verse 47, and that he wrote your name there in the book of life. In the book of remembrance, remembering those who honor him, who fear him, and who remember him, who look to him. What if your name is there? That means that in the areas where we do stumble, and we all do stumble, James says in James 3 and verse 2, whether that be my words, my words, my thoughts, that I now have a remedy. 1 John chapter 1, verses 7 and 9, for those mistakes. What it means to have your name written in the book of life, it means that instead of hearing, I never knew you, depart from me, workers of lawlessness, Matthew 7 and verse 23, that we can now hear, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over little, I'll set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master, Matthew 25, verse 23. It's not because of what we have done, it's not because of what I have done, but it's because of what Jesus Christ has done. It's because I have trusted in God's sacrifice uh, of, of his son, of his only son, John 8 and verse 24. And I have lived by faith, Romans 1 and verse 17. And I've sought to obey his will at every opportunity. And then God has then looked at me and said, you are mine. On the judgment day, God will be fair question we need to be asking is where are we heading where are we heading have we obeyed the gospel if we have and we live faithfully to it, what will judgment day be like for you will it be the rewarding of your deeds or the condemnation of your soul this morning the opportunity is available for any who need the prayers of the congregation who have a desire to study or would like to put their Lord on in baptism. If you would, and you have those needs, please come forward as together we stand and as we sing. Uh.